are entering into a season of Lent, we're also entering into a new sermon series as well. After many, many weeks and months in the book of Acts, we get to turn to another book in the New Testament, James, a little bit further down, um, just past uh, the larger book of Hebrews. Uh, a little bit of background on, on this. Um, the author is James himself. Well, which James? There's like 12 different James that are listed in Scripture. Uh, well, they're pretty confident, um, given many internal uh, resource reasons within the text itself, and eliminating some of the others from historical context, that this actually is James, the brother of Jesus Christ himself, which is quite fascinating, right? To grow up with Jesus Christ and not to really believe in him and, until after the resurrection. It's like, wow, I lived with a Messiah. I lived with God himself. And I'm looking back, yeah, I can kind of see that. <laughs> and how he lived out his, his life. Um, Right? You would have saw that on a regular basis. So this is James, the brother of Jesus. We saw him in Acts. He was one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church. All right? So he was uh, one of the ones that Paul interacted with over in the Jerusalem church. So he was a leader uh, there. Now, this is also one of the, we believe, one of the earliest written books in the New Testament, like in the early 40s. So barely a decade after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that James wrote this uh, early to encourage some of the, the believers that he knew of and those that had been the audience dispersed out the 12 tribes. It's kind of a cryptic term, Jewish term, that was used for Israel, but now in the New Testament, you see there's a new Israel, which is Christians, disciples of Jesus Christ. Those are the true descendants of Abraham. And so what he's saying here is that this letter is going out to all those Christians that are living in different parts of, of the Roman Empire, if you will, outside of the city of Jerusalem. And the key theme in here, amongst others, but this is the main one that's kind of weaving them all together, is true faith. What does true faith look like? Or living faith, because in chapter 2 it's going to say, there's dead faith. Dead faith. And he's going to contrast dead faith with living faith. And so this true faith, the way that we're going to Point it, if you will, or describe it is with that phrase there, cruciform love. Cruciform love. And so where does that come from? Well, Galatians 5, 16, we're going out of this into the New Testament. Uh, this verse is key to understanding James. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Okay? So true faith is going to work through love. All right? Where you see true faith happening, you're going to see acts of love happening. And I submit to you, those acts of love are cruciform in nature. Cruciform, cruci, means cross. Form means shaped like the cross. And so those acts of love are acts that are shaped um, after Jesus Christ, who was crucified. And then we're called to take up our cross and follow him too. So our acts of love are humble, servient acts of following God's will, of loving him, and then loving our neighbor, loving our enemies even as well. So this is a radical kind of love. We put, I hate to say this, but we have to put a, an adjective in front of it because there's so many different definitions of love in the world that we don't mean any of them other than this cruciform, Christ-centered, sacrificial kind of love. All right? So James does not explicitly teach the gospel here. He's assuming that these folks know the gospel because he's hammered it into their head for, for 10, 12 years already. All right? So he's assuming the gospel. We're going to see it in the first verse where he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, so he sees himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's assuming that all those he's writing to see themselves the same way. That Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Savior. And he's also Lord. And he's also God. Alright? That's a loaded statement. Now based on where we were in Matthew and Acts, that's got to be the foundation going into this. Because there are 55 imperatives in these five chapters in 103 verses. And imperatives are commands. They're laws. It's James telling us what to do. 
And we never get into the doing part as Christians unless we know the being and what has been done by God and in through Jesus Christ. That the good news of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, the gospel, is the foundation for the doing, the acts, the good works that follow from that. So we will be bringing in the gospel to remind ourselves of that all the time. Otherwise, we get into a works righteousness very quickly with this. And all of us are to see ourselves, just like James, a slave, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So I love this chapter, or this book. This book is about formation. It's about growth. It's about discipleship. It's about being active participants in God's unfolding drama. This is going to get after it. It's going to convict us. The only way it's not going to convict us is if you're not listening. Myself included. Because none of us are going to do what James says perfectly. Yet that's what it's called to us, as we'll see in these verses, is all about. Alright? So we're going to, we're going to get after it in, in James and what it means to live as a disciple of Christ 24-7, every day of the week. Alright? So with that in mind, all we have just a few verses. This is going to be way different than Acts. That was a historical narrative where we had like 60 massive verses that we had to navigate. This is one of the larger chunks that we're going to be doing. Four verses. A large chunk. Some of them are just going to be a verse long as we go through this. Because James is packed with um, imperatives telling us what to do. And we've got to unpack what that means and what that looks like. All right, so with all that might, let's read this. We'll pray and then we'll dive in. So James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Heavenly Father, as we take a look at these words that you inspired through your Holy Spirit, through James, your servant, many years ago. May they uh, be effective and dynamic in our lives today, shaping us and conforming us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. This is his name that we pray. Amen. Well, eight years ago, and actually in February, I had the opportunity to go up to a big harbor, harbor Washington. You may have been there before. Absolutely beautiful. Now, if you want to do school, this is a great place to do school. So I was doing my doctorate at this time, and the professor lived in Gig Harbor, and there were only about eight or nine of us in the class, so he was able to convince Florida that we could do uh, this class not at their campus in Pasadena, but in Gig Harbor. So we got to go to Gig Harbor and sit with uh, Chap Clark, Dr. Uh, Clark. Now, he wrote a book called Hurt um, back in 2002, I think it was, or eight, somewhere around there. This is Hurt 2.0, uh, a second uh, edition of this book. Now, what this was fascinating, this class was about seeing church as family. And for our purposes this morning, one of the key parts that we focused on was the dynamic of moving from um, childhood to adulthood. That journey that we have now labeled adolescence, which was no word and no concept in any culture up until 100 years ago. That's something that has just been invented. No such thing as adolescence. They went from childhood to adulthood almost immediately. Because everything in their cultural system, from the parenting, from schools, from church, from everything, society, all formed them to be adults. So that they're ready to be adults when they were 14, 15, 16 years of age. They made that transition really quickly as the brain transitioned into adult, adulthood as well. But here's the thing. So in, in the West and now around the world, uh, adolescence has emerged. It became kind of normative of the three to five year process. Well, guess what? It's now a 10 to 15 year process. Yeah, there's, there's some laughter to that, but this is, because we laughed through it too as we were going through it, you can't be kidding me. Um, the reality of what's happening here is that biologically, you can't stop this. Well, you could, but. Biologically, you become adults when the hormones start kicking in. And that's typically 
around 13 to 15 years of age. So biologically, you become an adult. Now add 15 years to that before you uh, become mentally and socially and emotionally an adult. You have an adolescent in an adult body capable of procreating and adult things with an adolescent mind. So the studies are showing that males don't traverse into adulthood typically this is horrible. Into their late 20s and early 30s. That means you've got 28-year-old, 30-year-old men out there that are emotionally, socially children, adolescents, that have not taken the full steps into adulthood. And for women, you're a little better than the guys. You do this a little quicker. Um, you get into it in the mid to late 20s. So it's still not that great. So the, the key thing with this is, what does it mean to move for um, uh, adulthood or childhood to adulthood? What are they looking for? Well, three things, basically. Identity, autonomy, and belonging. That a person needs to have a sense of identity, who they are. Okay? This kind of separation from mom and dad and sister and brother. That I am an individual. It's called individuation. That I am a modern day, create image God, unique, one of a kind. There's never has been, and there never will be another one of me. I am me. I'm not so and so, not so and so, not so and so. I'm me. And you have a strong sense of identity of who you are. Because out of your identity, that your practices, what you do, are supposed to line up with. And that's the autonomy aspect here. You start making uh, adult decisions for yourself. <laughs> You graduate and get degrees and whatever you need to get into the vocation so you can start earning and contributing to society and making a difference here. So there's autonomy. You're not dependent on your parents anymore or others for your well-being. You can take care of yourself. But there's a third thing, too, because that gets very individualistic. It's belonging. It's knowing that you contribute to others, to community, to society, that you have a responsibility, I have a responsibility, we have a responsibility to society to contribute, that our vocations are supposed to contribute positively to the flourishing of our society. And so you become an adult when you have all three of these things operating in your life. And if you're missing one of these things, you're not fully an adult. So that's what they're looking for. So the definition of adulthood is it starts with biological adulthood, but it ends with social adult, uh, adulthood. These are all social kind of things, how you interact with, with one another. All right, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it's going to lay the foundation for how we navigate the rest of James, knowing how this process of maturation happens. Because James is telling us to grow up. Okay, so you can keep it on here, that's fine. He's telling us to grow up. That's the end of those verses here, the, the perfect and complete. He so that's the goal of these trials that you're going to count all joy. We'll talk about in a few minutes. But the goal is you need to grow up. You need to mature. We all need to mature. You don't just become a Christian and that's it. You've arrived. There's not much more to do. No, that's just when the work begins. Until you're dying breath. Okay, so to understand the, the maturation process, the growth process, the moving from uh, childhood to adulthood is very helpful in understanding what it looks like to be a Christian, to be born again in Christ, to have a new identity, to become adults as in Christ, mature in Christ, to grow up in Christ. But I submit to you, there's a lot of adolescent Christians in the church, just like there's a lot of adolescent biological adults. And that is not the fault of the church, it's the fault of the leaders of the church who got complacent, that we talked about before, and failed to lead and failed to teach what it meant to be a disciple and to act with cruciform love and not just to believe that Jesus died for your sins and go to heaven someday, put a ticket in your back pocket and now I can kind of go and do whatever I want in my life because I'm good to go. Like, no, that's not what the scriptures teach. And James is very clear about this. Like, do not rest on the grace of Christ or cheap grace of Christ. 
thinking that it has no impact on your day-to-day -day living. It has everything to do with your day-to-day -day living. So Marcia, a psychologist, um, identified four statuses, if you will, and, and they're sort of like stages. And, and I love this because it helps so much to be able to see where you're at, where our kids are at, um, where you might be uh, socially as, as well, but also um, as a disciple of Christ. So the first is called diffusion. Diffusion. This is like uh, little kids, all right? Um, the identity of the parents are diffused into them, all right? They, they just absorb whatever it is their parents have. They don't know any better. And they're around their parents all the time, and so they're their influences on their, whoever their caretaker is, that's their identity. That's all they know, all right? So it's kind of conferred to them, and they don't have really anything to say about it. Foreclosure is a step further. This is where they start to have an understanding of what it means to be a Dillinger, or it means to be, put your last name in there. That I'm beginning to understand what it means to, to be a, a participant in this family. And I accept it, because I love mom and dad, I love my family, they're the authorities over me. So they foreclose on an identity that's been given to them. They're aware of it, they can even articulate it to a, a, a degree, um, and it's theirs, it's their identity that's given to their parents. But it's not theirs per se, it's their parents' identity. I believe who I am because of what they say. They haven't wrestled with it yet, because they can't wrestle with it, because the mind can't wrestle with it yet. It hasn't developed abstract kind of thinking yet. That happens in moratorium. This is adolescence, this is teenagers, bless their hearts, I was one too, I was in here. But this moratorium is identified by the word crisis. They take everything that was diffused in them or foreclosed to them and they start questioning everything. This is normal. They have to do this. I don't know if I believe what mom and dad taught me. That pastor's whacked. I don't know about what's said in scripture. This stuff, I don't know. And that's healthy to doubt and to question when you're moving from childhood to adulthood because guess what? Until it becomes your faith, it's not your faith, and it's not your identity. And what they're trying to do is struggle with, do I really believe what they believe so I can own this? And this can be mine, and I can fight for it, and defend it, and live from it. And that's what the achievement is, that you've wrestled with the questions of your identity, of who am I, and what's wrong, and why am I here, and how do I overcome? And I believe what the scriptures ultimately teach, or what my parents have taught me through, through the scriptures called achievement, but it has to do with getting through the crisis of asking the hard questions and doubting moving forward. Now, what has um, happened in uh, this is they found that the, the key problem of the development age is abandonment. That they're not developing because there's no one in their life to show them what it means to be an adult. That even though parents might be um, driving them here, driving them there, driving them, there's no in-depth time to be able to to navigate some of the questions and some of the, the crises that they're now that, that they're uh, engaging with. And so they don't get answers for this. And so they develop peer groups to which they try to belong in and try to find these answers, but they just get delayed longer and longer and longer and longer. And so we live in a society where identity is fluid. Fluid. And what I mean by that, and what sociologists and psychologists mean by that, is that you're not expected to have one identity. You're expected to have multiple identities. Now, we used to call it schizophrenia. <laughs> Seriously. That's been normalized as okay. That you know, you're in here, you're a Christian because you're in church right now, but you step out and you go to the farm, now you're a farmer. And you leave the farm and you go into the city and you become somebody different. And then you go to recreation league and you become an athlete. And all these titles that are roles and that we have responsibilities to become identities from which you operate from. Now the significance of that is that when you operate from a different identity than as a child of God, you're going to act differently. And so they saw in these studies that one child, or they all, unanimously across the board with this, would talk about how uh, they love their parents. They would do nothing to harm them. And over and over again, they said that as soon as they stepped away from that conversation, they would often have conversations with others about things that they were doing or had done or would do in their lives that would bring heartbreak to their parents. 
Those still sleeping around or stealing or uh, undermining the, the family values. And when this is brought to their attention, they get a blank stare in their face. Or they start to justify what they're doing. They, they can't connect the two together of how these acts over here within this identity is contra this identity over here. It's because they have multiple identities. And this identity says, okay, to do this. This identity says, not okay. So here's the thing. As disciples of Christ, we have one, God created us with one identity in modern day, image bearers of him. And in Christ, we're beloved children of him. And if we follow the cultures of this world, we're going to end up with uh, accepting multiple identities. So that we walk away from here, we may not even think of Christ or the gospel or Jesus or his kingdom for five days. And if you're not thinking of the kingdom or Jesus or the gospel, for days, you're operating on different identities. Because whatever identity you operate, you just moved into, it doesn't need the gospel. It doesn't need Jesus. It doesn't need the kingdom. So it's fundamental that we have an identity. Alright? So, back to the text uh, with this. Here's how identity development happens best, according to, to James, and how this operates. This growing up Thing that is not just new or to him, but Paul talks about this in other places as well. First Corinthians 3 says he's complaining that people of Corinth are just infants. I've been with you for three years and you should be adults by now. Or something, but I can't even talk to you as adults because you're still infantile in your Christianity. And Corinthians 14, he ends up saying, We need to be mature. We need to grow up. This is the goal here, folks. And Ephesians 4 just simply says, Grow up. <laughs> That we got to grow up, um, and that's that's our goal here. So that's that is uh, where we're we're heading with this. And um, I'll be sure to uh, keep with the next one here. So First Peter sixteen again, just to show that this is a theme that is through the New Testament, through Scripture, this growing up, and that we never fully arrive at the growing up. Take a listen to this from Peter that we just learned a whole lot about in Acts. In this you rejoice, but now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, and the next one in Romans. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has, who has been given to us. So this seems over and over through the New Testament um, of trials and tribulations. So as James starts, consider it pure joy when you experience trials of all kinds. Why? Because it's going to produce steadfastness. You need to know this. And this is a means to its end. That's not the goal. The goal is perfection and completion. Telos. Reaching the goal that God has for us. Which, by the way, does not happen fully in this life. Which means we're always growing and learning and training until our dying breath. This happens when Christ comes again and we get our resurrection bodies. We'll be fully so let's briefly take a look at this. We're going to see this throughout um, the entire book of Acts. So this consider, count, this word is important because the trials and tribulations in and of themselves are horrible things oftentimes. And so it, it says count these as joy. It's not that they are joyful. They're not. We just heard about that there's sorrow and grieving in some of these trials and tribulations that we find ourselves in whether emotionally or, or physically or spirit, spiritually, cancers or, or bunions or anxieties or um, conflicts within and without. I mean, there's literally hundreds of thousands of trials and tribulations of all kinds. He doesn't limit it to any of them. He just says all trials and tribulations consider pure joy. So Philippians, there's three times Paul uses it here. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Are they more significant than you? No. We're all created in the image of God and equal. But the posture of Paul's saying is consider them, that they're more significant than you, so that you might serve them and love them well. Next. Why? 
have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped. So he decided that, you know, I'm God, but I'm not going to count that, if you will, over you. I'm going to become one of you. I'm going to empty myself and become human. That's invaluable of what happened there. It took great humility to be able to do that, to serve his fallen creation. And then finally this one. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Same word all the way through. So he was thinking of those things that he had accomplished in his life as rubbish. Scubala, crap, is what it means. It's a slang Greek word, crap. Dumb, refuge. Now, were all those things dumb and crap and refuse? Rubbish? No. But he considers them all when he compares them to the glory of the good news of, of Jesus Christ. So, trials. When you're in difficult times, which we all are to various degrees, the posture we take is one of humility. And, and recognizing that through this, God can do amazing things. That is, mature you and grow you in your faith toward his telos for you, to his intended purpose for you. So first is consider. We've got to start with that posture of humility before we go anywhere else. And then steadfast, know what this is going to accomplish with you. You've got to stay steadfast through these trials and tribulations. Some are going to be, you know, minutes long. Some are going to be decades in life. Uh, excuse me, lifelong as, as well. Just a couple stories here real quick about steadfastness. All right, the first one is going to be Abraham. He's the father of faith. If you want to see someone mature in faith, Abraham is it. And the scriptures go back to him as the one that we look at as the one who was faith, the most faithful. Obviously, Jesus Christ is the one who we now go to. But Abraham is still uh, the one that's portrayed here. Remember the story of Abraham, right? The promise came to Abraham that the world was going to be blessed through his seed, through Isaac. Isaac was the one that the nations were going to be, um, that the tribes were going to be coming uh, from. It's going to be from Jacob. That. But then he's told to kill Isaac, to sacrifice him. What's he going to do? What would you do? The promise and the blessing is going to be through your firstborn son, Isaac, and then you're told by God to kill him. Talk about a trial and tribulation. So Abraham trusted God, and in Hebrews it actually says that, well, if here, here's his reason. If he's going to kill, have me kill Isaac, well, then he's going to raise him from the dead. He has to. The promise is through him. He has to live. It's just like Peter or uh, Paul getting from Rome, or Jerusalem to Rome. God promised me I'm going to get to Rome. I'm not dying here. i got to get here. So I'm going to trust in the name of God. I'm going to trust his character that he says the blessings through him. It's going to happen through him. And whatever happens here, he's going to take care of it. That's faith. Deep faith. Profound faith. And of course, God steps in. And he steps in. Stop. Do not sacrifice your son. But I'm going to sacrifice my son. I'm going to fry the ram as an image of that. But ultimately, Jesus Christ is going to be the son that's going to be sacrificed on your behalf. The next story. Let's actually skip that one. That's the Israelites in the wilderness. But the other one is Jesus himself. Okay, so when he started his ministry, we saw this in Acts. I'm going to reincorporate stories from Acts so we can see some of this narrative, historical narrative playing out. Jesus did this. When he was baptized, what did the Holy Spirit do with him immediately? Sent him out into the wilderness. <laughs> and it says there, to test him, same word, to test him. And it was to show that the faith of Jesus was solid. And that even though he was starving, and thirsty and desperate in some ways biologically that spiritually he was not going to give in. That the devil himself showed up. And we don't get the devil in our lives. We get demons, those low demons. Jesus got the devil showing up on his doorstep himself trying to tempt him. The devil only shows up a few times in scripture. And it's to attack Jesus. And Jesus doesn't give in. He stays faithful. He's steadfast. And that starts his ministry. It shows his maturity and his development 
as a human being who had faith in the Father and what he was called to do as, as well. So these are big ones, right? And we're called to faithfully live as a disciple of Jesus Christ, his beloved, in whatever trial that we might face. These are our two major examples. Um, so trials, consider if you're joy, steadfast, know who you are, and stay steadfast through those trials. Don't give in, don't shift into different identities. Why? Because the goal of this is your perfection and your completion. And you gotta let this happen, okay? The steadfastness is a letting of this trial um, play its part in your life. In other words, don't fight it, per se. Let God work uh, through it in your life. We, we try so desperately hard to get out of the trials. And it's not bad to, to pray that the cancer or this difficulty goes away. We pray for peace. But sometimes we have the expectation that he's going to make it go away because we deserve it. And he says, Paul, oh, you know, you get that thorn in your flesh, it ain't going away. That thorn's going to be stuck in there and it's going to keep hurting for the rest of your life. So guess what? Learn to realize that my grace is sufficient for whatever circumstance you find yourself in. Trust me. It's all right. And Paul says, in my weakness, then I am strong. Here's the dynamic that starts to happen with the trial. We trust in Jesus that when we're weak and the, the trials and that are, are too great for us, we realize, hey, I'm not supposed to walk in this on my own anyways in my own strength. I'm supposed to walk in this as a disciple of Christ. And showing my faithfulness and steadfastness through this, that this will not have a final say. That in the end, Jesus wins. It has won. And that's where the good news is there. And so a couple of verses just real quick here. Um, Romans 8, 20, 29, and again, this theme is picked up in other places. Um, it says, for those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the first among, firstborn among many brothers. And that's just a, a quick little um, phrase there that I want to point out. We're destined to conform to the image of His Son. That's our destiny. That's our completion. That's our telos. That we're supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. Which you've heard us say over and over and over up here, Lauren and Colleen, myself, and, and others. This is why. This is our daily work to grow up. To not get caught in diffusion or foreclosure in our identity that shifts from one place to another or someone else's identity and not mine that I own myself. That we're to arrive at achievement, that we're to trust that Jesus is Lord and Savior and God, and that we are servants to Him, slaves to Him. And that we stay in that achievement, adult status, where my identity is solid. And I know who I am in Christ. And that I belong to the body of Christ and responsibilities here to use as well. And I don't get to go off on my own and do my own thing and pursue the American dream. I'm to pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness first and foremost. And my responsibilities are to him and to his church first and foremost. This is where James is going to get at. He's going to start talking about wisdom and our language, and our tongue, and favoritism, and wealth, and all these things that kind of get in our way, that are trials and tribulations, and how we're to navigate this. So we're going to come back to this over and over again. Consider pure joy. Know that the step that is in, uh, the fighting uh, to hold to your identity as a beloved child of God is producing in you perfection and completeness, the development and growing up as image bearers of Jesus Christ, individually and corporately as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, again, we say this so often, it's so easy to say this, it's a whole lot harder to walk it. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, that we just spent 45 weeks talking a lot about this person that unites us with you in and through Jesus to empower us in our identity as beloved children of yours and equips us with gifts to be used that we might demonstrate the, the fruit of the Spirit as well. Gentleness and kindness and peacefulness and self-control and love and, and peace. So as we go through this book, Lord, I pray that we 
uh, allow your spirit to convict us and encourage us where we fall short and where uh, we have been steadfast. And again, we pray this for your glory and for, for our kingdom. So Jesus, we pray this. Amen.